Thanks for joining us this morning as we talk about the financial year ended 31st of October 2020 for IDOCs. I think everyone on the call will know both myself and Rob Grubb. I joined the business back in uh, June of 18. Rob joined in November of that year. And since that time, we've set about reforming and transforming IDOCs. And we're really pleased to talk to you today about the set of results that we produced in 2020, which I think is um, a really good stopping off point in, in the progress to date. And we look forward to explaining a little bit about our future strategy and the things you can expect from us going forward. So for those of you who don't know, um, IDOX is a software business. It supplies very specific products to help the public sector with its legislative and regulatory requirements. Um, as a result, over 90% of all UK local authorities are clients for one or more of our products. We have um, 8,000 customers and over 600 employees, um, offices mainly in the UK, but we do have a couple of outposts in Europe and the US. And uh, during the, the year, um, we've registered revenues of 68 million for FY20 and an adjusted EBITDA margin of 29% up from 22% previous year. So uh, just to summarize the activities that have been going on during FY20, um, as I say, we are a software business, primarily dealing with public sector software. And, um, but during the course of the year, you know, Rob and I uh, and the remainder of the team here at IDOX have been focused on bringing together our uh, slightly disparate, uh, previously disparate organizations that were run sort of individually and separately into a cohesive IDOT software UK business. So all of our software operations, including our uh, engineering information management business, are now managed by the same management team, have the same processes uh, fully integrated across the business and, and you've seen some of the benefits of that coming through into our financial performance, uh, which Rob will cover later. The other part of our business is, is based uh, in Holland and, uh, and in Germany. It's called IDOX Content. It deals with compliance, uh, which is training for e-learning platforms. And also we have a grants consultancy businesses helping organizations throughout Holland gain grant funding for R&D activities all of our businesses have performed well uh, during the course of the year. Some have been a little bit more impacted than by COVID than others, but generally speaking, every business has performed really well. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of the detail of um, each of the di divisions uh, as we go through this slide deck. But as I say, really pleased to report a good set of strong results with revenues and profits in uh, areas of the business performing in line with our expectations at the start of the year. So the investment case for IDOX, well, as you, as most of you will know, you know, we're a significant UK market brand and presence in stable and advancing core domains. We like to have significant positions in key niche market areas. We believe that market leadership in those areas also brings uh, sustainable and growing margins. So we're very clear about what we do. Um, I think we've brought a new focus to the business and we celebrate our strengths in the areas of public sector software. As many of you will know, we've refreshed our management team and our board, uh, and that's been absolutely critical in this turnaround and, and delivering the ongoing change that we've seen. Um, we've well trailed that we think there's good organic growth in the markets that we address. Um, this year, we've seen mid to high single digit growth in our core public sector markets. Um, we have a really strong uh, ARR base, annual recurring revenue base within the business. Again, that's up during the course of this year. And I think provide that provided with the visibility we have with order intake and the increase in our order book gives us tremendous visibility of future earnings uh, within the business. We've moved margins from 22% last year to 29% um, EBITDA margins this year. Uh, Rob and I, when we came into the business, felt that 30% was a, a good margin target to go for. I think we've arrived at 30% a little bit quicker than we thought we might. And as we go forward, we're, we're certainly aiming to move that on to about 35%. And we can outline to you a little bit later on how we see that uh, being done. Uh, we've had significant cash generation, improved cash generation within the business. Uh, that's helped us pay down debt. And I think this, you know, we're, we're now in a great position where by the end of this fiscal, 
we pretty much have obliterated all of the debt within the business. And that cash generation uh, and uh, flow through from our improved profit position has now puts us in a position where we're well funded, well positioned uh, for future growth and certainly well positioned for accretive M&A. Um, and as you'll see, uh, and as we've announced, uh, dividend today restored and we have a progressive future dividend policy going forward. So internally uh, within IDOCS, we talk about our, our walk, run, fly phases. Uh, our walk phase you know, began back in FY18. At that point, our market cap was about 130 million. As we've come through that and into the run phase, um, where we focused on improved management information, tighter infrastructure, and integration of all our activities, our market cap today is around 235. And we feel we're coming out of that run phase now into the fly phase, let's say the improved margins in the business, improved profitability, most importantly, the improved cash flow as a result of, of that activity now puts us in place where we've been able to invest in our ability to drive all, uh, our organic growth. And I think we're seeing that coming through and see that continuing into FY21. And it also gives us the opportunity now to think about uh, how we move our, our clients from on-premise solutions into the cloud and also to grow in organic revenues, as I say, through targeted and very selected M&A in our areas of strength. Um, where bolt-ons will integrate very tightly with our existing offerings to customers. So just the highlights of, of last year, you know, revenues at, at 68 million, up from 65 and a half the previous year, net debt down to 16.1 million from 26.4, and our recurring revenues, uh, ARR up year on year. And I think for, for us, you know, we see that ARR as being very important we know software businesses um, that are valued well have good recurring income. And it's certainly our view going forward that we'll be aiming towards getting to 75% of our uh, revenues recurring as we go forward over the next two to three years. So extensive transformation across the group. Um, I think that's fully delivered uh, the results that we expect in FY20 and given as a really sound platform for 21. Um, we've improved our operating margins following the improvements to our revenue governance, cost control, and the process activity we've put into the business. Material reduction in net debt, as we've discussed, I think that's made everyone happy and certainly has been pleasing from our perspective. We do talk about four pillars within the business constantly. I'll talk about that a little bit later on and, and the next phases of that program for us. But it's been a way to bring our organization together very coherently, and to allow all of the talents around IDOX to fully contribute to the success of the business. And as a result, you know, that's created much better engagement from our, our teams across the business and a massive improvement in their satisfaction of working for IDOX. Um, and that's, that's been really well received by everyone. Uh, and as we said, you know, we're really well positioned now to execute on the growth phases of our strategy including the addition of some very targeted bolt-on acquisitions. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rob. Uh, Rob's going to take us through the financial review, and I'll pick up again a, a little bit later. Thanks, Dave. Uh, morning, everyone. So yeah, my name's Rob Rob. I'm IDOPS's CFO. Uh, so again, welcome to everybody uh, to the webcast. Quite a few familiar names on the invite list, a um, few, few new names as well. So welcome, everybody. I'm just going to take five, 10 minutes to run everybody uh, through the financials um, in the announcement released this morning. So if we start with uh, the highlights, most of which uh, actually Dave just covered in his slide just there. Uh, so revenue up strongly, up 4%, both across recurring revenue and non-recurring revenue, as we saw more of the order book coming through, but at the same time, generally across our portfolio. Um, saw more of a bias towards recurring revenue. It's just a bit dire up strongly. Again, today's comments, we are up 30, 36% year on year, around 29% EBITDA margin, uh, a bit of a boost from IFRS 16 adoption, which is in the FY20 numbers, but, but not in the FY19 numbers, but nonetheless, um, a big step up in adjusted EBITDA. Adjusted EPS up following uh, sort of those earnings metrics up very strongly uh, to, to just over 1.8p. 
and therefore um, we're able to declare our first dividend under the new team, uh, the reinstatement of the, the dividend at IDOLS of 0.3 pence per share. Um, and as Dave's mentioned a few times, so uh, net net debt down uh, significantly for us uh, in line with the plan, I should say. So uh, our, our net debt components comprise uh, cash in hand, our banking facilities and our 6pm Maltese bond that's been in the business for a few years now. That Maltese bond is around £11.5 million. So excluding that, um, we actually have bank net debt of around £5 million. Um, and on the current trajectory, uh, we expect to, to largely extinguish that certainly over the next six months um, uh, to, to the bank at least. Moving on, we have details for each one of our three operating business units, uh, public sector and EAM, uh, both of which form our, our core IDOC software units and also our content business. I should add all, all of these slides are on our website alongside the announcements and also some paper research from Progressive. So I'd encourage everybody to have a look at that. In terms of public sector, I mean, the first thing to observe is there are a few different businesses in the portfolio. Um, IDOX is famous for, for pretty high market shares in, in most of these, in particular in, in Plantech, where the majority of the UK uses our software for uh, managing planning applications, building control, and other forms of uh, licensing around environmental services. Uh, this division was up strongly year on year, as you can see from the numbers up from 45 million to uh, just a bit over 48. And we saw a lot of margin improvement in this part of the business in particular. And uh, those familiar with the IDOC story will know that uh, there was quite a bit of transformation in this area of the business in FY19. Uh, transformation that included quite a bit of revenue recognition restatement, but also tightening up of the operating model in this business in particular quite a bit of consolidation and integration work uh, for a number of these businesses which have been acquired over the preceding 10 years and now operate under a single management structure for, for most of our functions. On the right-hand side, you can see adjusted EBITDA up strongly and the, the graph that I really like on the bottom right-hand side is the recurring revenue graph. So this, this is a, um, a big element of our recurring revenue in the group. Um, that has, again, stepped up year and year uh, for a couple of reasons. So firstly, we have a full year of our Tescomi acquisition. So Tescomi is a cloud-based uh, public sector building control plan tech business that we acquired in, in August 19. And also, as I mentioned on, on my opening comments, um, generally across the portfolio, we are, we are edging towards more recurring revenue as we do more deals, both through more balanced revenue recognition under the current arrangements, but more generally as we're moving customers across to, um, to consume our products via the cloud. And finally, at the bottom there, uh, just a comment on order book. In fact, across all three divisions, our order book was up really, really strongly. So our order book are our non-recurring revenues that we have signed an agreement with the customer to deliver. But as at the balance sheet dates, uh, we have not yet recognised any of that revenue because the work hasn't yet been delivered. So at the end of FY20, closing order book of 12 million across these various business units, which is a step up on, on the opening order book of 9 million and obviously gives us increased visibility for the following 12 months. Moving on, uh, so our engineering information uh, management division is, uh, as, as we've got there in the bold in the middle, this is our document management system for, for really heavy industries such as uh, oil and gas, such as uh, infrastructure assets such as airports and, and, and other assets of the like. Revenue was actually slightly down during the year. This was an area of the business that did certainly see some impact from uh, the emergence of COVID back in uh, March, April and May. And I don't know that all seems a long, long time ago now, but for those of you that remember, oil and gas in particular got quite heavily hit with, uh, with the oil uh, prices sinking. And so we did see some projects move right However, we, we did take some steps to readjust the business, not least as part of bringing it underneath our existing public sector software business and bringing it within those management structures that we talked about earlier on, as well as shaving off some costs along the way, primarily through savings and T&E, as, as obviously we stopped travelling. So therefore, just despite the decrease in revenue, we actually uh, stepped up uh, our adjusted EBITDA, even accounting for the um, for the boost from IFRS 16. 
And as I mentioned, some of those deals did move right and we did still close them, but it was much further uh, to the right than we were expecting. So we closed the year with a significantly better order book than we had previously, up at 1.4 million, which again gives us a really, really strong running start for FY20. And on, on uh, recurring revenue, similar to my comments on PSS, really, this is again, um, being a software business, a very high proportion recurring revenue business for us. And you can see on the graph on the bottom right hand side, we're, we're around the sort of 75% uh, recurring revenue in this part of the business. Moving on to our content business, this uh, comprises a couple of fairly separate businesses actually, but they do operate under a single management structure. Uh, out of the Netherlands. So our compliance business is an e-learning business, um, delivering e-learning technology to customers in Germany and Belgium. And our grants uh, business is a Netherlands-based business delivering uh, expertise around uh, R&D funding applications and other sources of, of government funding, walking customers through uh, through that process. So again, slightly down in, in the year. Again, we did see a bit of a shift at the initial impact of COVID back in April and May as, as some of our opportunities slightly move right. That all has largely recovered now. Uh, we're, we're certainly seeing beat rates at the end of the year and currently they're consistent with sort of pre-COVID levels, albeit it's a very different model clearly as these things uh, are, are being delivered wholly remotely. EBITDA is up. Um, but actually, in, in this example, that pretty much is solely due to the IFRS 16 adoption. So excluding that, we're pretty flat year on year. And to the uh, adjusted EBITDA margins, this is one of the lower margin aspects uh, of the group, primarily because there's very little uh, sort of core software involved in the solutions that we deliver to customers. It's, it's largely a people-based business. And then finally, yeah, on a similar point on, on the recurring revenue on the bottom right hand side, again, this is a relatively low recurring revenue business for us. Uh, we do have recurring revenue primarily in the compliance business, but um, very little across the rest of, of this division. Having said that, we do still have uh, very good visibility on revenues in this business. We have um, very good experience of the customers that we have and their expected buying patterns. So, in grants in particular, whilst we come into a year, not necessarily with contract revenues, we do have a very high degree of visibility over uh, how we think those customers will, will order moving throughout the year and delivering revenue. So moving on, we have slides around the consolidated income statements, uh, balance sheet and cash flow. Uh, the, there's probably not too much to add on the consolidated income statement. The three divisions that we just talked through uh, obviously account for the top two lines on revenue and adjusted EBITDA. Uh, moving down the P&L, DNA was up primarily because of RFS 16, but also slightly higher investments in uh, software and R&D. Interest was up uh, following the drawdown of, of some slightly larger facilities, and tax was actually down as an ETR because our, our tax rate is starting to normalise a bit more now as we're moving to sort of more normalised trading in all of our operations. Uh, we have very few unrecognised tax losses anymore, primarily because we're profitable in pretty much every location. So again, our, our ETR just generally is becoming a bit more cleaner. And moving down the pier now, I think most other things are, are broadly in line. Uh, the acquisition and, and refinancing costs, uh, you'll, you'll know we did do a refinancing in the year uh, in December FY19 to put in place our enlarged banking facilities. That actually was following the refinancing we did the previous year. Uh, however, sat here today, uh, those facilities cover us for another two years with a further potential extensions for two years beyond that. So we're, we're not expecting to, to have to go through any more refinancing exercises from this point onwards. And to the actual facilities, uh, it's referenced in a couple of places in the presentation, but we have a 35 million RCF, as I mentioned at the start of my section, we're about 5 million in the red to the bank. So we have about 30 million of available liquidity. In addition to that, we have a 10 million accordion and, and that's coupled with the ongoing really, really strong cash generation of the business. Uh, we feel we're in an incredibly strong place with the financial resources to go and execute on, on the bolt on MA that uh, we mentioned in a few places to really help scale uh, some of the stronger parts of, of our business. Uh, moving on to balance sheet, there's probably not a huge amount uh, to mention here. Uh, I, I guess by exception, we do have a, a bit of a higher VAT balance as, as a business did take advantage of some of the VAT deferrals uh, offered in the middle of last year. 
um, that's due to be repaid in equal instalments over the next, um, well, from this point over the next sort of 15 months or so. Provision slightly higher. We, uh, we, st- we, we still have a property that uh, we're associated with from sort of the original 2017 period. We're working through the detail of that, but as at today, um, we have a provision for that. And uh, just my bottom point there really repeats my comments around the uh, the strength of the, the financing that we have. And a reference again to that Maltese bond. So that's, for those that don't know, that's a 13 million euro bond. It was actually put in place uh, prior to Idox's acquisition of a group called 6PM back in 2015, I think it was, and then came into the Idox group as part of um, part of Idox's acquisition of 6pm. Currently, that just sits there. Uh, we, we we do have, I suppose, emerging liquidity to consider whether we should be repaying that. But as at today, we're pretty keen to keep our uh, flexibility with the liquidity we got, given some of the MA opportunities that we see coming up. Uh, on the cash flow, uh, I think we've, we've probably covered most of this. It, again, strong cash flow generated in the period, primarily from you know our, our high margin EBITDA uh, returns coming off of core businesses. That following the uh, restatement of our revenue policies is just much higher from a from a sort of core cash conversion point of view and drops down very strongly to our cash balances. And some comments on future guidance, really, in terms of revenue growth targets, we've sort of mentioned this a few times now in in, in the couple of cycles that we've been through. So in our core public sector software business, um, we we think sort of mid single digits is a pretty sensible place to expect from the existing uh, portfolio of, of, of customers and products that we have. Having said that, you know, we do think that this is an area ripe to supplement with bolt-on MA to really help scale our operations in this business. We think we have quite a compelling story to take very successful niche products and really scale them through our existing infrastructure to really help drive uh, scale in this business, both at revenue but also at earnings level. Uh, in terms of EIM, that continues to transition to SaaS, both in terms of net new business that comes in, but also uh, existing uses. I and mean, we see that growing at high single digits. And similarly with content, uh, COVID aside, the trajectory of that business has been to grow around sort of 6 to 6 7% year on year. We don't see any reason why that shouldn't continue. In terms of EBITDA, uh, margin targets, uh, as we mentioned, uh, we're pretty much there with the 30%. Um, albeit with a little bit of help from RFS 16. So our our longer term aspiration is to get to 35% over the next three to five years, primarily as a result of really capitalising on these marginal gains that we see in the business, which is more consolidation, you know, more high quality execution of some of the improvements that we put in place, as well as that scaling the business with bolt-on acquisitions, which we think we can really help uh, be accretive for the business and really help drive overall margin. I mentioned cash conversion, dividend reintroduced um, at 0.3% for FY20. We're currently guarding endless that that will step up to 0.4, 0.5, 0. 0.6 uh, over the coming years as a proportion of expected adjusted EBIT uh, that is stepping up year on year. Um, and we're pretty comfortable with the dividend at that level, but it is something that we, we keep under consideration, not least because of the cash that's starting to come out of the business. Um, and, and what happens with that cash, given you know our aspirations around uh, bolt-on M&As. And that's me. I shall pass back to Dave. Thanks, Rob. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking everyone through that uh, so succinctly. Uh, I'm just going to cover a few slides um, to talk about operations and strategy. A number of these things will be familiar to you, so I, I don't want to um, strain them too much. From our perspective, everything during FY20 that we plan to do despite COVID, um, was executed really well. I think that's sort of testimony to better and more productive engagement we have with the staff uh, and all the teams across IDOX. Um, but, we, you know, we've adopted this four pillars framework. Um, things have gone extremely well. The acquisition of Tuscomi um, has gone particularly well. I rebranded as IDOX Cloud, fully integrated with our operations and the previous uh, leadership in that business taking wider leadership roles within the within the group has gone particularly well you know we're working uh, much more focused now on clients and what they need going forward thinking about you know their futures post covid and how they can accelerate cloud deployments with idox um, and some very good and positive conversations with most of our clients about that as rob pointed out we we exited some subscale operations in ireland and malta 
Uh, and I hope that you'll have all seen the complete rebrand that we've we've had within iDocs. As we often say within the business, market leaders lead. You know, we it's very important that we have an influence in shaping the environment that our customers operate in day in day out. Not just through bringing technology to bear, but actually you know shaping their future and widening their horizons on what technology can deliver in terms of improvements and uh, increasing efficiencies and effectiveness within their own organizations. Uh, you know, more, most important of all, I think, has been, you know, everything that we've done to bring together this, this business as one unit. And um, this one IDOCS approach has gone extremely well. And, um, you know, we're, we're delighted with the outcomes of that today. So it gives us a really strong foundation uh, going forward. So again, the four pillars, we, we've spoken about these things uh, in previous presentations uh, with great gusto. I think in particular for me, you know, the organizational simplicity has been absolutely critical, integrating our corporate resources. Um, you know, one example of that would be in Germany this year. We've taken the infrastructure there, put it into our data centers, um, changed our office dynamics around a, a little bit and made it a much more uh, you know, consistent representation of, of everything that happens across the rest of the business. So it's not just in the UK we're doing these things, we're driving those efficiencies across all parts of our business. And this single management methodology, I think, has been absolutely critical to success. And I hope latterly, you know, you see improved and, and more open and better communication from IDOTS. Um, you know, we, we're very transparent about all the things that happen within the business. We like to have a single set of messages that our staff and our shareholders and our customers get from us. We engage with them all the time. We had a CEO broadcast, which we do on a quarterly basis just a couple of days ago. You know, I was able to say there that, you know, our net promoter score, our internal net promoter score uh, from the teams has gone up about 40 points since, since Rob and I joined the business. And I think that's just indicative of how people are coming together across IDOPS to help us achieve great things. So as we said, we, we're coming out of the run phase now into the fly phase, um, you know, building on the momentum that we have in the business and to be the most influential player in our chosen markets and the, to expand our scale in the markets that we choose to address. I just want to stress that as we do go into M&A, the acquisitions that we make will absolutely be in line with the strategy that we've deployed to date. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about ESG today. Uh, the most impressive thing for me with IDOCs and ESG is the fact that it, ma the vast majority of activity is driven from the teams themselves. We have really engaged groups across the business that want to make an impact either in, with the environment or in the communities that we work and serve. You know, there's been a lot of tremendous activity going on this year, in particular around, you know, a, a, um, a program we've got, IDOC Celebrate, a program to encourage mentorship and development of women within our organization. Yeah, we are underrepresented in that score, but Ruth Patterson, who heads up our legal and, and HR teams, myself, viewers in the business are really driving that top down to make sure that we, we, we create great opportunities for women within IDOCs. And also to invest in our leadership talent um, is one of the things I wanted to do when I first arrived. We had a few other things to sort out. Um, in the early stages of, of, of my time here. But, you know, we now have um, about 30 of our key leaders across the business invested personally for them in a, in a, in a sort of 18 month leadership program uh, for the talent we've got across the business and to arm us um, with all the skills we'll need as we expand the business and move it on uh, as we go forward. Let me just talk to you quickly about our own fly phases. Um, I think people have, have asked about the type of acquisitions we see ourselves making. Uh, just to be clear, we expect them to be good nearby bolt-on acquisitions that we can make that have relevance to the markets we currently operate in and the products we currently have. So ostensibly, that's going to be public sector software products, things where we create and, and have our own IP that we can integrate with the rest of the portfolio and makes good sense to our customers. And as, as Rob pointed out earlier, I think you know the size of these things we're looking for is, is classically it's that sort of, you know, three to five million revenue, you know, maybe um, organizations that have got to sort of, sort of circa 60 people. Uh, we think there's a great infrastructure in which we can bolt on that kind of capability. And as I say, make sense for customers and help those businesses break through some of the glass ceilings that they get to 
when uh, they get to that kind of size, using our infrastructure to help them uh, accelerate sales um, and also be more efficient and effective in the way that they deliver that capability to customers. So uh, that's really it from us today. Uh, I hope we've kept it roughly to about 30 minutes. Um, you know, in, in summary, uh, we ticked the boxes on all the objectives we set out for ourselves in FY20, a good, solid, um, striking financial performance, I think, in what were challenge, early, you know, challenging circumstances early on. It's, it's easy for us to forget now the first lockdowns and some of the distresses that, that created, but uh, IDOX has adapted brilliantly to the environment that we faced and um, has continued to, to positively move forward. Um, the consolidation and integration of our business into um, a, a really good sales and delivery function with a, a range of software assets and one operating model has been absolutely the heart of that success. And we are ambitious for the group. You know, We feel excited about the opportunities that present themselves. Um, we think there are good organic and inorganic opportunities for us. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to FY20 with um, with with some 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 real gusto. So um, yeah, uh, that'll be it from us. Uh, we'll be happy to hand back and obviously to take any questions that you may have. And we've got a question from Steve Robertson from Canaccord. Steve, go ahead and ask your question. Just a, a two questions on PSS, the PSS business. Um, can you give us an idea of the, the revenue growth normalised for Tuscomi? Because I think um, in the not the year just reported, but the prior year, it was only in for four or five months. Um, and what that would be, I, mean, I presume it would be under 8%. But also, I noticed on your, your outlook uh, for PSS, you've said mid-single digits longer term, whereas six months ago it was low single digits longer term. I just wonder... What's changed there? I've got one more as well, but I'll, I'll hang off with that one. Well, I, I think the answer to the second one is Rob's just getting more ambitious for the business as we go forward now. So it's uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, genuinely speaking, you know, genuinely, we, we feel we have a good proposition in the markets that we're serving. You know, uh, the acquisition of Tuscomi, absolutely strategic for us. You know, we, we firmly believe that. You know, the future for, for clients operating in, in local government is into the cloud. Um, we spent quite a bit of time making sure during FY20 that we would have great reference points for all of our customers who are going to want to make that journey over the next few years. And so whether it be you know the very large, the medium-sized local authorities or the small ones, um, we have great examples now across the whole business of organizations that have made that move and the benefits that they can gain from uh, adoption of the cloud and, and, and moving forward in that way. So I, th I think genuinely we, we we feel we've got a really strong proposition in that area, and therefore you know mid single digits is, is right. Um, and I think you know it, it just feels that that's the sensible part now for us to point people to. And um, should, should I just pick up that point about just claiming just type, type away to check my figures? Um, as, you, as you mentioned, it's about 8% uh, in the PSS division from uh, just under 45 up to over 48. So difference without three and a half million. About half of that is due to, to SCOMI, actually. So of the 8% year on year graph, the year on year increase about half that's directly because of the addition of SCOMI. So therefore, it's underlying sort of around about 4% between 19 and 20. Uh, just on the order book, the orders as at 31st of October 2020 were 16 million. Um, and just wondered what the unwind of that is. Will all those orders turn into revenue in the current financial year? The, the majority will, yeah. I think uh, from memory, it's something like 75% falls into FY21 with the majority of the remaining 25% falling into FY22. But yeah, the majority of it falls into FY21, which is a, a typical profile, by the way. You know, we, we, we do generally, as I think we've talked about before, have very high levels of uh, revenue visibility for any given year, given our existing recurring revenues, plus the order book on top, plus what we know is a pretty high beat rate activity from the existing customer base. Um, so for this year in particular, we, we do have better 
uh, visibility because not only do we have a, a bigger overall target for FY21, but as you say, we have a higher closing order book uh, to come into the year with as well. And um, we'll go to James Lockyer from Peel Hunt. Um, three, three from me, please, if, if you don't mind. So, firstly, um, now that you know, you've got EIM and PSS under the combined umbrella, obviously you've mentioned synergies there, having a single structure. But I'm wondering, if, is there any is there overlap in skills between the dev teams so that actually, you know, could, could dev teams move between functions to allow for higher utilization rates when one sec segment gets busier? Um, than the other one, for example. Um, shall, I, shall I ask three or just try to do one at a time? It's up to you, How? Okay, and then this, the second one, I guess, just on the bubble chart. So you talked about getting to 75% recurring revenues over the medium to longer term. How should we think about the relative sizes of the subsectors within the bubbles? Will they, may, will they remain relatively similar or are there opportunities for some of them to over-index in terms of growth? And then finally, on m and you mentioned public sector is obviously the core port portion you go through, but any particularly subsectors that are interesting within public sector, or are there some potential IP targets that could be relevant across both public and private sectors? Thank you. I, I don't like any of those, Rob. You can have all of them. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, yeah, appreciate, uh, appreciate the questions. Um, do, do you want to, John? John, do the M and A one first, Rob. Can I talk about that? Yeah, sure. So um, it, it is interesting, actually, James, that, that you raise because uh, we we do challenge ourselves really as to uh, how focused some of the M and A needs to be. You know, in, in an ideal world. Um, we'll find something that directly sits inside the existing portfolio uh, from a sort of product point of view. So, so what we have at iDocs, as we sort of noted in some of the slides, is a very extensive account management network across the UK. You know, we are pretty much in every local authority. And within that, as, as we've described, you know, our, our primary um, products are around plan tech, you know, so planning, permission, building control and, and environmental services. So in, in terms of the opportunities to source um, uh, sort of niche players directly in those uh, sort of product sets, whilst there are opportunities, you know, given our sort of already high market shares, they, 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 there aren't a great number of opportunities, albeit we do all we can to sort of track those and stay in content with those. So the discussion really therefore moves on to sort of how far away from that core do you go? Now, of course, we, we've got various products uh, in local authorities across elections, across transport. Um, we also, of course, uh, health, have health products as well. Um, so as at today, um, you know, we, we're really looking at M&A targets within those, uh, those those sort of verticals, but really the, 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 the bit that makes the the sort of the financial arbitrage bit work, apologies for a hard work accounting term, but the bit that really makes it work is that account management network throughout uh, the UK. So whilst we can bring in products that may sort of sit alongside uh, some of the plan tech stuff, for this all to work, it has to be sensible that our account management uh, network can realistically sell those into our existing customer base. Otherwise, you know, that, that sort of leverage, leveraging effect of, of sort of bringing new products into our existing infrastructure is, isn't really there. So, so I guess in summary, you know, fairly open-minded about products that maybe sit slightly aside what we do today. However, it still very much needs to be in the local authority and NHS world um, for us to make the most of our existing infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think just to re-emphasize that one, I mean, you know, the success we've had to date in pushing and, and growing the business has been that focus on what else can we do for our existing clients, as well as sort of, you know, winning the new business through the movement to the cloud. But it's, you know, the extension of and, and you know, driving more things to clients who have some very complex and, and you know, uh, demanding requirements upon their time now. So, you know, we're in that great position where we have access to a lot of people through the account management network and through the products that we supply, we're getting much closer to customers and understanding what it is that they need going forward. And that's influencing how we're thinking, you know, not just about M&A, but the areas in which we might put that M&A. Um, so, you know, in answer to the, that same question about, you know, is there other opportunities for pit bits um, to overperform in, in that bubble? We, we think there are, we've had some really good success in our 
uh, in our health business with you know products like Lily, you know, which taking care of you know, all the sexual health activity that's, that goes on and testing within within the country. Um, you know, areas like that, those kind of niches carved out of what's happening across the NHS are the, are the places for us to go play. Um, you know, I don't see as being one of those generalist NHS providers doing all that great stuff that they're doing around, you know, GP surgeries and the CCGs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but absolutely carving out a few niches in which we can be, you know, a real help to people. Um, you know, de definitely would come onto our, our horizon. Um, but the local government area, you know, does cry out to us for things that we can continue to uh, provide to, to that market space in which we're extremely well known and, and, and very highly regarded. Um, in terms of the first question, James, on the integration side on development and, and these resources being one of the real booms, I, I think, over the last 12 months of us being able to categorize our skills, not just by um, the sort of, uh, of um, IP knowledge that they've built up in their market space, but also to understand the skills that we have across the group that we can um, transfer capabilities across different product sets and different knowledge bases. And, you know, because we, we, we know uh, how many people have great agile capability and, and how many people are um, they're trained and skilled in particular pro um, code sets, et cetera, et cetera, we've been able to make far better utilization of those skills and make IDOTs as a result a much more attractive business to come to because you're no longer defined by the product that you work on, um, but you're defined by the skills and the capabilities that you can bring to project teams that have that huge amount of domain understanding within them. So, you know, it's a much more attractive proposition, I think, than, you know, IDOTs would have been two years ago to someone uh, who wants to make a real impact in, in public sector development, it's, it's a great place to be. And we have a question from George O'Connor from Stiffel, who writes, thank you for sparing us mention of digital transformation until slide 19. But as you did, does your software portfolio need to change beyond cloud migration? <laughs> Sorry, I think that's a great question. Um, well, look, you know, we uh, we do talk about digital transformation here at IDOTS, but in the context of the niches and the, the, the areas in which we work. Um, and I think the digital transformation that we see in the areas of public sector that we work in are slightly different to those, I don't want to call them body shopping businesses, but those skills-based businesses that go and do uh, fixed pieces of work where the IP is fundamentally remaining with the clients. So, you know, these are people that are actually sort of, you know, doing design, build, run style projects for people where, you know, it's maybe the run side is, is now just being uh, delivered directly by the client themselves. Um, you know, we're, we're unashamedly IP builders. I mean, I, I realize that sometimes that's a little unpopular, but, you know, we feel there's a real benefit we add uh, by building IP for customers, particularly in local government, where, you know, if you're, if you're working in the departments of, you um, of education or, you know, uh, the DWP or something like that, you've got an absolute army of people around you that can keep you abreast of all the activity that's going on in the agile world and digital development. And you can react and change as, as circumstances prevail. Um, in local government, it's much tougher to do that. You know, um, local government was hit hard. It has much more reliance on software and it has much more reliance on the suppliers that supply that software. And so, you know, we absolutely take it upon ourselves to help clients drive that digitization, smart connection with customers, smart ways of dealing with business processes, smart ways of becoming more efficient and effective, and where essential and necessary, delivering all of that um, through the cloud and on a demand basis. And, you know, that's, that's been our approach. So our movement is not just one way of just moving people to the cloud and sort of, you know, uh, figuring out some sort of hosting capability and disguising that as cloud. It is digitization, it's proper SaaS delivery. Um, and that, that's our future in that market space, which we think needs more assistance and help than perhaps some of the central government areas. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Ian Poulter from Progressive Equity Research, who asks, please could you expand on how the cultural aspects of the changes that man the management team have made to IDOCs were reflected in the financial performance of the group during full year 2020? Look, I mean, one of the big changes, as I say, we've had a sort of 40-point improvement in 
um, the NPS for, for people within IDOCs. And, and I hope, you, you know how it is, when, it, when a company has, it went through some of the challenges that we did, naturally people become a little unsettled. They become a little bit uncertain about their own futures. And they, it was difficult to make a connection with the vision of IDOCs and the work that they were doing. And the results that have been produced weren't meshing. You know, people were working very hard, they're very, very dedicated and committed, but it wasn't coming through um, in results. And, and what we've done through the four pillars is, is just make it absolutely clear to people that if we do the right things, then the results absolutely transpire. And um, by improving our communication, doing all these things, I think people now see that their extra effort is worth making because not only is it going to produce better results for the company, but they themselves are going to get recognized. I mean, you know, we've uh, gone back to pay increases across our business that hadn't been done in five plus years <laughs> prior, prior to us arriving. And obviously it was very difficult to do back in 2018. But, you know, I'm, I made a pact with the business that said, you know, I think, I think the company, its shareholders and its staff, uh, you know, form this little triangle and, if, our, if we're going to go back to paying dividends for shareholders, it'll be on the basis that we're treating staff well and that they're also getting pay increases. But staff can't have pay increases if we're not going back to dividends. It's that, it's that mutuality that we're trying to create across the business. The net effect of that is, as I say, people are now willing to go the extra mile. They are being recognized on their merits, but also I think they can see that they personally can make a massive contribution to uh, the profitability of the organization wherever they are. You know, our, our people, you know, the people that get involved in procurement activity, um, the people that say, you know, we could do this process activity better and cheaper are now heard. And we follow up on all those marginal gains. You know, Rob and I, absolutely from the top, we will follow through anything that we think can improve uh, the productivity in the business or improve um, our margins within the business. And everyone knows that. So we have constant ideas coming forward about how we can improve uh, and people see that fall into the bottom line and i think they feel now more connected to the business and feel that they're just more engaged so uh, it's a little bit loose i can't give you you know the a percentage of, of how that's improved but what i do know is it wouldn't have been achieved without it because otherwise you'd have just had a sort of management layer across the business being quite dictatorial about what needs to go on and that would not be sustainable it's very different here at IDOTS. We've got a complete engagement across the business and we are all in it together. Thank you. And we've got a question from Emily Ritchie at Progressive Equity Research. Emily, go ahead. Um, hi. So what did you learn from the integration of Tuscomi uh, that you might put to use in future acquisitions? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. So, uh, <laughs> a few things for sure. Um, so one one of the thing one of the things I personally learned actually from from Dave and the team, having I think done is it nine Dave or some some number over the last ten years or so, was actually the uh, the integration starts as part of the due diligence process. So um, you know when we're going through due diligence, rather than you know engaging a whole load of external parties, we do the due diligence ourselves. You know that's that's the head of sales running the rule over them. That's the head of product. That's that's me as head of finance to to really make sure that you know we we know the business inside out, either um, you know pre transaction to then you know really kick on once the deal's closed. So that 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 for me was probably the first thing that certainly will make sure we bring to uh, future transactions and indeed with some of our sort of prospecting and, and pipelining when when things get to a certain stage we do start to bring in some of those individuals on, on a selected basis the other uh, couple of things I, I, I would note um, in, in terms of uh, staff engagement that's that's clearly hugely important and we're very careful to um, engage with staff very very quickly in, in a really really authentic way both as a leadership team, you know, in terms of making sure that we're visible, but also on a sort of peer-to-peer -peer basis throughout the organisation, and then we sort of make sure that um, that that happens. Very, very conscious. There's there's, there's a bit of a uh, tension is the wrong word, but from an IDOC's point of view, we want to obviously integrate the business as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible. But of course, being very very cognizant that we're acquiring businesses that probably because of their scale do have a slightly different culture to 
you know, being part of a, a big, bigger organization um, than IDOX. So when I think back to the Tuscomi business, you know, that, that was a relatively um, natural progression, actually, over the, the first 12 months. You know, we, we didn't particularly force it in, in, in the early days, but by the time we were sort of in that six to 12 month period, it just felt like a natural step for both sides as we started sort of bringing their their, their, their their functions underneath our management structures so again that's that's something we'll take into future um, future acquisitions and I think the key thing is you know that level of engagement as I say both at the leadership level but also peer-to-peer throughout the the, the organizations yeah I mean just a little I was just going to say just a little bit of a war story Rob and I the rest of the AMT are mentoring about 45 people across the business at the moment um, and one of the one of the people I have is is with uh, Tuscom, the old Tuscomi business, and we were talking about their experience of you know IDOX, and of course their fears were natural ones. Big company coming to take us over, it's going to be their way, not our way, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and he's just said, look, none of our fears were were realised. Um, you know, we we felt it was dealt with really sensitively. Communication was great. Everything that you said you'd do, you did. And you know, you listen hard to the things that we felt where we could we could add some capabilities back and embrace that. And you know, I think it, given that you know the next series of acquisitions we see ourselves making and probably of similar size type businesses, um, it's been a great experience for all of us, and we'll certainly be taking those things through into the next ones. And that's the end of questions, David. Do you have any closing remarks? Um, well, you know, I think, it, you know, as I say, these are probably a well-trailed set of results. So, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful for people, to, you know, paying attention to a story and, and thinking about the business. I just think IDOX is in a great spot now. You know, um, our integration has gone, um, you know, incredibly well. Um, you know, revenues are up 4%. We've got margins up 7%. Debt's down 39 We've got an increased order take. Uh, and, a, and a much increased order book coming into this year. Um, you know, our recurring revenue is also up, and the fundamental stats supporting the business now. I think you know, offer it up to to continue its success over the next 12, 24 months. And um, you know, as I say, we're really excited about that and the opportunities it brings out. So you know, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it, and look forward to speaking to you all um, in the coming months.